This is Mari Robson of Love Lulu Creative, a podcast that supports and celebrates artists and creative entrepreneurs while giving back to the community in a unique and meaningful way. This is episode number eight, and I am so excited to end 2018 with one of my absolute favorite interior designers, Abby Fenimore. Abby and I go way back to the early blog days where we met, and we've had lots of opportunities to work on different projects, even though she lives in Dallas and I'm in California. We have collaborated on several things, some really super, most of them, really super fun, but we did have one kind of fiasco that we talk about on the show and how she handled it. This whole episode is about her interior design process, how it began for her, how she runs her business now, how it's changed over the years, uh, the highs, the lows. I mean, it's a really open, honest discussion about what it's like to be an interior designer. So if it's something that's on your bucket list or you were thinking that you wanna pursue a career in this, this is an excellent episode for you to listen to. Also, if you're thinking about hiring an interior designer, this will give you a little bit more insight to the process and what a designer has to actually go through when they're putting together all those gorgeous, lovely, happy, joyful rooms for you. Um, That's probably one of the things that really drew me to Abby is her use of color and, and it's sophisticated, it's joyful, it's a little sassy. I mean, she really knows how to bring a room to life. And I just love her style. She's one of my favorites, definitely, definitely. And uh, apparently she's one of Dallas's favorites too because she has been uh, voted the best interior designer since 2012 all the way through 2018. So that's pretty impressive. She's also been featured in Rue Daily, Apartment Therapy, The New York Times, The Washington Post, HDTV, Uh, Better Homes and Gardens. I mean, the list really goes on and on. She's accomplished. People take notice to her work. And I just hope that you guys will really enjoy this because she's really been very open and generous with all this information and advice. It's an excellent episode. And I just know that you guys will enjoy Abby as much as I do. And I'm so glad I have an opportunity to get to share her and her gorgeous work with all of you. So stay tuned. Hi, Abby. I am so happy to be here with you today and have this opportunity to talk with you all about your interior design work and how fabulous you are. (laughs) Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited and looking forward to our chat and sharing little bits of information that get stuck inside my brain. I love that. I love it. So uh, we go back kind of a, a ways. I was trying to think about when we met, but I think it's back in like early like 2011 or 12 or, or something like that. Yeah, it may have even been earlier than that. And I was thinking about that this morning before our call. Um, I know I found you through blogging because do you remember back in the mid 2010s, I guess, or whatever you would call them, when blogging was really kind of um, becoming more popular okay. uh-huh. and, and you're meeting people easier that way. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how we met. And of course, I instantly fell in love with your watercolors and your illustrations. And I think I actually had you help me create a few things for my shop at the time. I did. And it's so funny. (laughs) I look back and I'm like, Oh boy, I have grown a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think we can all say that. I know. Right. I look back at my early stuff and I'm like, wow. Cause that's, that was actually when I first started watercoloring. I, I, that was a whole new medium for me. Um, but you know, I, I remember you because I'm an interior designer too, although I'm on quite a little hiatus right now and pursuing more artwork. But I just then, now, always, there's very few designers where I see their work and I'm, it kind of makes my heart flutter a little bit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> very few that would inspire me to actually want to paint their work. Like I think I've painted a couple of the, the rooms that you've designed just because they're so inspiring to me. Thank you. And I love that interpretation of a room. I know you see that quite often. You'll see it in magazines or on shows where they kind of show the illustration, which I'm 100% sure they create that after the room is done because everything's right. too accurate. Always, always. <laughs> always. Done, yeah, because I've done like those interior renderings for like a show house or something, and it never looks anything like what um, what I came up with based off of the things that the designer gave me to. Right, right. So, um, 
But I, you know, what's interesting about when I go through that process is because I am an interior designer, I thinking about, oh, this is really interesting that they chose the scale of this or those color uh, combinations or those, the pattern mixture and all of those things. And I can really see quickly like who is very, very good. You know what I mean? When, right, I'm, yeah. when I'm painting it, because I, I go through your process when I'm, when I'm actually painting it, which is super interesting. So, yeah. Anyway, you're just my inspiration. Thank you. I'm fortunate to have clients that um, love to push the boundaries of color and texture and pattern. And when I first started, I mean, I knew I loved that, but I felt a little insecure, especially being in Dallas, because the style, and in Texas, tends to be a little bit more dark woods the olives and rust reds and you know the kind of sometimes kitschy texan themed interiors which i don't really Mm -hmm. love and i've never really been drawn to um i mean i can appreciate the beauty and the interiors and the process that the designers go through but that just wasn't what i wanted to do and so when i first started my business i got really insecure thinking oh my gosh am i gonna have to do this or how do i fit in and how do i get clients but i literally I can't even begin to tell you how fortunate, even lucky I am to have been um, connected to my clients through mutual friends that allowed me to really push boundaries, even coming right out of the gate with my business. So I've never really had to struggle with aesthetics. I mean, I have a few commercial clients that I work with. Um, They aren't 100% my style, but they do love to let me bring a little bit of it in. So that makes me real happy that they're Hey, let me try to see if I can get you to bring some of your color and texture in, but tone it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're Which I love. drawn to you because it you it is this really authentic voice. It's very unique. You you stand out with your design aesthetic, and so I'm sure they're drawn to you. And they want a little bit of that, but they're kind of scared. Right. They don't really know how that's going to actually work for them. So right. that's that's really interesting. So did you you grow up in Dallas? I did not. I'm actually originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, okay. And I spent quite a bit of my childhood there. My parents divorced when I was young. And when my mother remarried, her husband was from South Louisiana. So I ended up in high school down there. And then I ended up at Louisiana Tech. It was um, literally halfway between my mother's house and my father's house in Arkansas. And you know, I kind of thought, well, I want to go to this big university and I, I want to do all of these great things. But I went to visit tech. A friend of mine was like, if you're going to do interiors and architecture, why would you go anywhere else? They literally have the best program in the state. And I thought, how is it better than LSU or even Texas or Arkansas? But at the time, Louisiana Tech was one of the few universities with interior design accreditation, which was really important to me. Mm-hmm. And of course, my family, because they were paying for it. So mm-hmm. um, we visited the school and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, like most universities, it's got a lot of the historic elements and I loved it. And architecture was, I thought, well, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do interior design, double major architecture. And I got about two years in and I thought, I, I mean, that's a little aggressive. I think I'll stick with interiors. <laughs> it was just really, really tough curriculum. But um, I am fortunate that I have that kind of um, experience from a small university because that's how I grew up, you know, growing up in smaller towns. And I loved that. And I felt real comfortable doing that. And um, fortunately it was quite easy to get a job. You know, when I got out of school in 99, I don't know how it is for kids getting out these days. You know, you always hear sometimes it's easier or harder depending on their field. But um, you know, I always knew that I wanted to do interiors from a young age somewhat. And so um, that's always kind of crazy because a lot of my friends, would, you know, get really stressed. What do I do? What do I want to do? My parents are pressuring me. And, and I was fortunate enough to have parents that supported all the creative classes I wanted to take Mm -hmm. and everything I wanted to do growing up, even though it may have, you know, financially put them in a bind at times. But um, I'm thankful that they sacrificed for me to do that and that they Mm -hmm. got me that education because, you know, coming to Dallas is also a little intimidating when you're the small town girl from Arkansas and Louisiana. So, um, you know, you just have to focus on you and do you and keep the noise out. And that's how you make it in a big city like this. <laughs> that, sure. that was actually a real, that was one of my questions to you because Dallas is, is, is big, you know, and I, you know, what's so fun about doing these interviews is like, I've known you for a long time and I, I adore everything that you do. But when I do an interview, I, I kind of look a little bit deeper and I can't believe how accomplished you are. You have, oh, that's like, really nice of you to say. And like, 
featured and contributed to like every single noteworthy blog, newspaper, magazine. And then you were Dallas Best Interior Designer for the past six years. I mean, that's pretty impressive for a small town. Yeah, yeah it's a big <laughs> honor because it's like anything, you know, being any fish in any pond is always challenging. And of course, insecurities and confidence are always things that are going to be tested within your industry and personally. And I don't know, I, I think I, I grew up with people who, and I don't mean to say simple minded because that sounds insulting and it's not, but you know, my grandparents weren't highly educated. My parents were the first, you know, in our family to go to college and my grandparents were very proud of us when we went to school and when we succeeded. And, and I spent a lot of time with them growing up. And I think that for sure um, influenced who I am today. I'm not saying I'm hundred percent perfect. I'm sure they would bop me over the head sometimes, but you get things <laughs> driven into you, right? They're constantly saying it costs nothing to be nice to somebody. It takes nothing out of your day to hold a door or smile. You just never know what someone's going through. So get out of your little attitude and pity party and realize that you know there's other stuff going on in the world around you and you don't have to be that kind of person. You don't have to, as my mom's mom always says, you're being ugly. And she didn't mean physically ugly. She meant your attitude. You know, you're being ugly. Why are you being sassy? You're being ugly and no one wants to be around someone who acts like that. And I was like, well, <laughs> then whatever, you know, so it kind of makes you buck up. But, you know, I think of them often both of my grandmothers passed away within the past two years and I hear their little sayings and their reminders in my head. And basically, you know, what that did for me was it made me feel like, well, why can't I have my own business? Why can't I ask this person to let me work on their home? Why can't I go get this or accomplish it, you know, in this amount of time? So it's getting all that noise that goes on in our world mm -hmm. to just quiet down and, and really focus on as my um, Catholic grandmother always said, you know, God gave you gifts and maybe you're not out in Honduras building churches, but there's something that he put you on earth to do. And it may not be a big deal to others, but it will be a big deal to you. And when you find it, my dear, cherish that and never take it for granted. And so that's what I try to remember. So when you say things like, oh, you're on all these things and I see you here and there, um, I just try not to think about it because it overwhelms me and it, it is very, um, it's humbling and it's important to me that I've, you know, set out to do things and actually done them. And I hope that I've been kind to others along the way, especially when other designers reach out and they, they ask you, how did you do this? What do I do? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, you have to step back and say, okay, I know you're busy, Abby, but remember you used to be there too. So <laughs> take that moment to connect to people, whether it's, it, you know, does something for you or not. I mean, you're doing something for someone else that needs it at that moment. So that's how I try to look at, you know, my attitude in a big city. No one's, no one's, um, no one's better than you. They're just different. And so I think that's how I always approach it. Um, I think it's wonderful to see people succeed because I know how hard I work. And so when someone else gets to that point in my mind, I think, I don't know her story, but I can, I must imagine how important this is for her and what she had to go through to accomplish this as well. So I try to, to keep that perspective. Well, that's very humble. <laughs> I well, mean, it's not every day, I promise. There are days <laughs> too. No, I mean, I think that's a really great attitude to have because you never know that person that you help out may one day hire you for your dream job. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, all of those or, or become a, a good friend or someone yeah. that um, brings something positive to your life, which yeah. you know we could all use. Well, and you actually practice what you preach because I know you and I, uh, we've designed products together, which is kind of my love, but we designed some wallpaper together and it was a yep. huge fiasco. <laughs> it was. Like I told you, I said, this has nothing to do with you. It's, it reflects on everyone and you just have to be honest um, with your client and they really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, you always say I'm getting ahead, but I'll kind of just say this because um, I know you're going to ask me, you know, what's the best advice that that someone has given you and, um, and not even about my business, just in life. And I think it, it goes across all elements of anyone's life. It's um, trust and transparency are earned, not given. Absolutely. And it's, um, again, it goes back to that foundation of just morals and values that I was raised around. But, you know, my dad was always a real, he was military and he was a real big stickler for trust and transparency. 
Um, you know, when you're a child and you, you white lie, it was like, you know, don't lie to me and give me a reason to make this worse for you. If, it, if you did something <laughs> wrong, we've got to learn how to address that and, and move forward. And, and I took a lot of that into my business and I thought, okay, if I was this person and I just spent, you know, this huge amount of money on, on whatever this is in my home and it, it's not working out and it's falling apart or it's bad or it's wrong or I don't like it. How would I want someone to treat me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because it's easy to get frustrated and be like, really lady, you're frustrated over a $400 pillow. Um, because it's, it's more than the pillow at that point. Right. So you right. have to just say, okay, I'm going to be transparent with this person. They've trusted me in their home around their family and with their finances. So this sucks, but I've got to figure out how to make this right. And I think, you know, you and I working together, that situation wasn't easy and it right. went on, I feel like forever, but forever. it was a manufacturer default, right. defect or it, <laughs> whatever. It got, but, to, uh, it got to the point where you and I were, were at our wits end and we couldn't do anything else about it. And I literally, the reason I got through that is because I stayed in contact with my client and I just continued to tell them, I know it's not about, I'm sorry anymore. I'm just telling you what's happening and my hands are tied. So I got to a point where I just said, you know what? I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat it. And then I'll figure it out later and whatever happens happens, but I'm not going to allow them to sit here anymore and, and fret about it. So let's just move on. And then you and I spent more months dealing with it and they had, you know, they weren't the wiser. They didn't know. So, um, that was the good. power of having a really excellent and dear uh, designer working for you is they, they troubleshoot all those problems and don't even let the client see what's going on. I mean, the client saw obviously what was going on there, but sure. you, you handled it in such a, such a classy way. And I think, what is that saying that they talk about? Like you, you really know who somebody is when you travel with them right. <laughs> under <laughs> stress. It was like, well, this was, I mean, this was really interesting. I thought that you were so, um, we just thought you handled that way better than 99% of the people I meet in my life. <laughs> so well, it's, anyway. um, that's nice of you Part to say the job. there were days I felt like I was going to lose my cool, but <laughs> it's yeah, also I mean, people, people it's don't understand how frustrating interior design can actually be. You know, it's, it's yep. so much more than just the like 20% actually designing and 80% yeah. problem solving everything, you know, that comes along the way. Well, wow. Okay. That, that was interesting yeah. <laughs> and excellent, great advice. So were there any mentors or was there anybody that gave you that when you were starting out in, in design and I mean, did you go to work for somebody right away or did you always just out the gate? You were your own business. No, when I graduated from college, I went to work for Herman Miller, which is oh. basically, you know, high-end office furniture. And I was a sales coordinator and I just thought, you know, it was the best thing on earth. I was so excited. I had a job and I had my own apartment. <laughs> and I um, was really, really excited. And then I got an opportunity to go work for a little small boutique design firm there. I was in Austin at the time. And oh my gosh, I literally was like, this is just, this is amazing. And I remember um, my dad was kind of my, my go-to guy for counsel and advice. And he was so very level-headed and, and honest with me. And he had a way of um, letting me be excited, but still <laughs> helping me tap the brakes on, on my mm. getting over my head and excitement. So I remember calling him and, and saying, dad, I'm, I've got an offer to go to this job, it's, but it's less money. And, you know, we went, talk through and I ended up taking the job and I loved it. Well, this was what they called the dot bomb, I guess. And at the time in Austin, everything was based on, you know, online web and things like that. And it just crashed and I lost my job and I was really freaking out and devastated. And, um, my dad was like, well, you just got to suck it up and figure it out. And so from there I thought, okay, what do I want to do? I'm not, I don't really think I'm ready to go out on my own. Well, I got an opportunity to move to Dallas for, um, a product rep job. And I thought, well, this isn't really interiors, but let me just tell you, I feel like that completely changed my career path. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so much about how commercial and even residential design firms worked because I was a product rep. I called on them. Um, I asked for their time. I asked for their business and, but it, it wasn't like hardcore sales. I mean, it was sales, but it was, you know, I loved the product and I loved what I did. And then I had another opportunity and, and left um, that job after years and 
went to, you know, direct manufacturer. And then years after that, they got bought out and you kind of see the writing on the wall. And I thought, okay, what am I doing? And my husband looked at me one day and he's like, Oh, I'm going to go get your um, DBA and your LLC. And I'm going to just get you business and you're going to be a designer. And I'm like, okay, buddy, whatever, you know? (laughs) Um, And he, he did actually, he named my design firm studio 1025. Um, we talked a lot about in school. We, we always called it studio. We, we didn't call it design classes or anything. We just said, no, I have studio class or whatever. And, um, and I always thought it was a little arrogant to name something after myself just, and my name gets pronounced incorrectly all the time. So I'm like, there's a whole lot of a mess going on there. So, um, he named it studio and then 10 T E N for the 10th month. And then 25 for the 25th day is our wedding anniversary, which sounds really cheesy, but I think that was actually the most kind romantic thing he ever did for me. Um, and I, I love it. And I think it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, I don't think about that when I think of my business name, but I love that he did that. And I think it was really special and um, I think it turned out pretty great. So he actually, you know, got me in gear and he went and did it. And my first client I had while I had my other job. And so I knew that I was going to transition and and do this. And let me tell you, I was scared. I was like, what am I doing? And then all of a sudden I remember talking to my dad and he was again, a very, sound advice. And he's like, why are you scared? Like, why do you care? What are you losing? I mean, you have another income right now, but as long as you don't let it interfere with your, you know, productivity at your current job, then, you know, I fully support you. And I just thought, well, I'll just piddle with this. I wasn't going to take it seriously. I mean, it blew up so big. I had three or four clients before I knew it. And then there's a lady here in Dallas named Rebecca Sherman. And she was with um, Modern Luxury at the time. And she's moved around a little bit since then. And she called me out of the blue. And this was literally, I'm not kidding you within six months of me and Drew setting this up and deciding I was going to do it. And she said, hi, I'm Rebecca Sherman. And, um, I saw something on your blog (laughs) and I would love to talk to you. Call me back. And so I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And I called her and (laughs) she's like, look, um, I know you're new and I've kind of seen some of the things on your blog and I really love your eye for color and everything's very vibrant and fun. And my client um, was a rookie in the NFL that year, which I'm sure did not hurt the situation and the opportunity for me to be um, recognized in this article. And she said, I'm only going to probably, they'll just say one picture, maybe two. It'll be really tiny, like a little sidebar strip. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. I am so excited. And we had a phone interview and I was on top of the world. And when that magazine came out, I had almost a three quarter page. She had a picture of me Wow! and she had um, a really nice shot of the room and I about lost it. I mean, it was literally, I think, and I'll never forget this. It was the best moment um, in my business and my career. And to this day, when I see her, I literally want to just hug her neck and love her forever. And she tells me, Abby, stop. (laughs) But um, I don't think she realizes how important that was for me. It really gave me the confidence I needed to keep going and know that I could do this. So um, I'm thinking for people like her. So when you ask about people giving you advice and getting you started, um, it's kind of unlikely. (laughs) Yeah, I really do believe that. And And, you know, now that I look back, like exactly what you said, I look at my pieces from then and I think, oh my gosh. And I do too. I look at, you know, the photography and things I could have done differently and our cords that are in the photos. And, and now I'm like, but you know what, that's, that was such a great time in my business. Um, you know, it's the, it's the honeymoon phase. You don't know any different. (laughs) (laughs) True. You're just living it and everything's great. And so, um, you know, again, I, I got started out, um, on a good foot and fortunately had the right people, um, give me a platform to, you know, do something with my business, which was great. I think that's a really great story, especially to, um, people who are listening to us who may want to pursue a career in interiors is that it's interesting that, you know, many established, um, business professionals will look to the younger generation to see what's on trend, what's new, what's what's happening. And 
maybe, and then the younger generation doesn't necessarily have the confidence, but they know what's happening. So she saw that you knew what was going on and, and was able to grab you, but you were like a little on shaky feet right there trying to, <laughs> right. Say, I'm going to jump in anyway, you know? So it's right. Like, I'm like, what's the point? Might as well do it. Right. So if you're young and you're just starting out, like sometimes you just got to go for it. I mean, you can't yep. just, you can't be timid about it, especially when it comes to, to design for sure. So that's a great story. I love that. I want to, it, it makes me want to ask another question. If you were, I have a friend who has um, had a very successful business, but she really wants to shift in, into interiors and she's super creative. And what would be your advice to somebody who is, you know, wanting to shift over and get into interior design? What would you, what would you tell them? So I'm assuming she's in a creative field already. Yeah, or she would be. Yeah, very, very creative field. But she, right. yeah, she definitely well, has the aptitude to do it. But um, what would be your advice? Because I've given her advice, but I'd love to know what yours would be. I'm a big believer in planning. Um, it get I get made fun of it being control freak and a planner often um, in a loving way by my friends and family. But you know that's a habit that my dad um, taught me. You know, you can't plan everything, but you got to have a plan. Mm -hmm. And preparing is half of the battle. Now, being able to accommodate things that don't happen the way you want, you know, that just comes down to your your character and, and how you choose to you know look at things. But I think if it's um, that's kind of not saying an easy transition, but if you've already got that creative drive and that love. Um, I think the most important thing is, is to educate yourself, you know, mm -hmm. start to educate yourself on your, where you're going to go for your resources and be prepared. So no, you may not start out with the client you want or the first five or six clients that you want, but that will also obviously give you great experience. But I think the more prepared you can be on your end, the more confidence it will give you to know, okay, well, this is actually the direction that I'd like to go with my business. Because I thought in my mind, I want to have this huge firm and I want to have all these people and this is my dream and this is what I want. But what I realized is as I started to execute my plan and um, make those changes and kind of bend and break based on you know what was worth it and what wasn't, um, I knew the look I wanted. I knew the type of client I wanted. So I, was, mm -hmm. I feel that I was prepared when that came down to it. Um, but then I started to get into it and I thought, okay, if I continue to add people to my firm, which is great and it's wonderful. And I, I did get to that point, actually. It was the year my father passed away about four and a half years ago. It was in 2013, 14, around that time. And I was literally overwhelmed with emotion with how much my business had changed and grown and all the opportunities that I decided to take. Um, and so. I got to that point and I felt like I had, had let myself down because I didn't want to do what I'd always wanted to do. I didn't, I didn't want to work myself crazy where I lost the love of what I did. And, and I love what I do and I, I know I'm good at it um, because it shows in my relationships with my clients, which mm -hmm. is the most amazing thing about what I do. And I guess, you know, for someone starting, you know, kind of think ahead, like, where do you want to be? And then be prepared for that not to happen and think, well, if that doesn't happen, where do I want to go? So it's as simple as, like I said, knowing your resources. I mean, I researched, okay, I need to know fabric lines. I need to know showrooms. I need to know where to go here, there. How do I find things? Because I can go into a home and I can implement the process that I feel is best and what I've learned through my experience. But how do I actually do it? Mm -hmm. You know? Cause it's all, it sounds great and fun until you actually get thrown into the mosh pit and then you're like, Oh God, what? Do, oh God, what do I do? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, um, those things sound completely elementary, but they're, they're very important to the process and also relationships. Um, you're only as good as, as who's behind you, right. In your relationship. Uh -huh. So like, for instance, the situation you and I went through, um, if you would have been this mean, horrible person and you would have just thrown me to the wolves, <laughs> and that would have made it a lot more challenging for me, but you weren't, you're a good person and you stood up for yourself and your beliefs and your product. And you didn't throw the manufacturer under the bus. You didn't throw the printer under the bus. Um, I mean, we discussed the shortcomings and then we also discussed how to get out of them. Mm -hmm. So 
it's also your perspective and attitude. And, and a lot of people think, well, I'm just going to ask Abby how she did it. And, and a good friend of mine, Allison Conklin, she um, helps me a lot with public relations and she's just the kindest soul. But she and I laugh because we call it the ATM, right? Um, people just think they can come to you and stick this card in and then just get this wealth of information from you. And it doesn't work <laughs> like that. It's just, I'm not an ATM. I can't mm-hmm. just spit out what you want to hear because everyone's thinking is different. Everyone's perspective is different. You know, um, how do you want your project to go? And I, I put a lot of pressure on myself when I do presentations. And then I remind myself, you're doing this to yourself. Mm. They're going to love this. You've done what you needed to do to find out what your client needs. Now just do it and quit stressing out. And I am, you know, almost 11 years into my business and I do it every single project. I'm doing it now. <laughs> I've been doing it this week. I'm working on a sorority house and I'm so excited about it and the vibe is going and the design's coming together and they love what I'm doing. And then I have to go actually put it on paper for them to see it. And I freak out. (laughs) I'm like, Oh God, well, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go get the dry cleaning and maybe (laughs) like I find a way to kind of get out of it because I, I suck, I psych myself up, but, um, I've that's learned. my favorite part is putting it on paper. Well, duh. <laughs> well, sure. See, I, and once I get started, I'm right. good. It's like, yeah. you know, what am I scared of? Why do I do that? So I've really spent a lot of time figuring that out. So when people come to you and they're like, how did you do it? What do you do? It's like, I mean, I, it would take the rest of my life to explain to you how I did it. And it may not even be what you want. You may look at me and think I'm absolutely ridiculous. And I'm lying to you that there's no way that what I'm saying is true. Um, but it is. So, <laughs> so people wanting to get into this and young people, I think a lot of it, there's no shortcut. You can't take an elevator to right. success. You know, that little, that true little saying, there's no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs and, and you're bummed. Oh, I love right. that. You get up there. Yeah. I so, love that. That's a great, that's a great The thing. bottom line is it's freaking hard work, people. It's mm-hmm. hard work and there's stressful times, but there's great times. And And I will say this one thing that I, after about three or four years into my business, when things really started to hit their stride and I knew who I was and what I was, you know, wanting in clients, I had a client that, um, the house is absolutely stunning. I I adore it to this day, but I would wake up at two in the morning and four in the morning and not because of, um, the wallpaper installer didn't show up or this didn't work or this happened. It wasn't because of any of that. Um, my clients stressed me out. I mean, Oh, and I am I an a few of those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always say I offend more than I get offended. And I don't do it to be mean. It's not out of meanness, but it's like if you can't be honest and shoot people straight, then what's the point? Um now I have learned to be a little more tactful as I've grown up in <laughs> adulthood. Um and a lot of that was just immaturity in high school and college and stuff. But I mean, this person literally and they were a wonderful person, but they made me feel like I was this um it's a really harsh word I'm thinking in my head. Um, they just made me feel like I wasn't <laughs> worth anything to them, that I was kind of their whipping boy. And it's when I wow. say, jump, you say how high, and do you realize what I've done and this and that? Oh, and yeah. I just, I sat there one day across the desk and I looked at them and I said, do not ever speak to me like that again. I've had enough. I Good think it's know. best if we move on. And I literally was like, well, I'm being completely rude right now, but, um, and I know it's coming out of left field because I had never spoken in my mind about the situation, but I just lost it. And I thought, you know what? I don't need this. I don't need to wake up at two in the morning with whelps and an upset stomach and stressed out. And it's over what? Over you being the boss of me and wanting to feel like you control me because that's not happening. We work together. I don't work for you. And, mm-hmm. and I always keep that in mind. And that's one thing too, as a designer, you know, I don't want to be made to feel like I work for someone and, and, you know, I have to do what they say and I owe them. It's like, we're partners. You're paying me to do this because you see something in me that, that you love and that you want to implement in your home. So have trust in me. Mm -hmm. And so now I've, you know, I've actually completely changed the way I approach initial design meetings. Um, you know, a lot of people always say, well, what's it going to cost? What's your fee? This and that. And people stress about that. And I said, look, I know attorneys charge by the hour. I do too. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to nickel and dime you. I want to make a great living doing what I love and I want to do the best with your budget. So it's important that we spend that initial time, whether it's an hour, 30 minutes, whatever. I go to their home. I don't charge for that. I mean, I don't see it as a waste of time. I see it as um, precious time because that's when you, people will tell you 
what they want you to know about them, whether they know it or not. So if, you can learn to, if you can learn to read that in that, you know, first, ooh, even five, 10 minutes, you see how they live, how they treat um, things in their home, people in their they're home. wearing the colors. They right. Wear. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you. So um, that's something that I think is crucial. And, you know, when it comes down to, to talking money, again, it's the transparency. You have to address it because it is uncomfortable. I don't like discussing the credit card bill every month with my husband, but he's like, Abby, seriously, with the Amazon. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. Some of that was not me. But, you know, I I don't like discussing it because no one wants to be, you know, in uncomfortable situations. So I try to approach it like this. So this would be advice I would tell, you know, someone wanting to be a designer or um, switching over into that or even anyone in a, a small business that has to address this. Well, first of all, just address it. Um, but ultimately, if you're honest and you take that out of the way, then they feel comfortable, right? So I just yeah. say to them, it's important that you trust me with your money. If you tell me that you have $100,000 for me to do the interiors of your home, whether it's paint, carpet, any other little architectural changes and furniture on and on, then I need it to be $100,000. I don't need it to be $150,000. Uh -huh. Same goes if you have $50,000 to spend, but you tell me you have twenty five dollars or thirty. dollars What that does is it lets you down and it, I'm not able to do my job. And you think that sounds crazy. Of course, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, that's what I want to spend. If you want to spend eighty, then tell me eighty. It needs you need to be comfortable with it, and then I'll be honest with you and tell you what we can rightfully do with that money. So if you come to me and you're dishonest about what you want to spend because you think I'm going to go over, then it's never going to work between us because I'm going to bring you a design plan that's going to squeeze thirty thousand dollars worth of things into your home when you really have fifty or sixty to spend, and then you're disappointed because you think I'm a horrible designer because I brought you a table that you think is cheap or a fabric that you don't really think what you wanted. So tell me what you really want and let's just figure out how to make it work. I mean, that's, that's big because, you know, I don't want to spend money that you're not comfortable spending. Um, another thing that I found successful, what works for me is, um, again, getting it out of the way, just telling people, okay, you want to do all this, but you don't think you have the budget of the money and maybe you get paid in commission checks twice a year. And, and people are honest about that too, which I love because it helps me to better understand their situation. So I have a, a client right now. She's um, a single girl or girl lady, whatever. She's in her forties and she is just the coolest chick ever. And she's very, I've known her for years um, through my husband and she's just very frank about things. And she wasn't being like that with me. And I finally said, okay, what's the real deal? Just tell me what you want. Because it's like when you start thinking about a car or a house, like you have to start with your dream in mind. What do you really want? And then from there, let's be realistic. <laughs> and right, she's right. like, okay, I like that. And then, you know, cause I noticed she had some really beautiful, expensive antiques that she had gotten in Italy, um, things from her grandparents. And she's was not embarrassed, but maybe thought, well, the designers here, she's not going to think these are great. And I looked at her and I'm like, if you love this, we're going to make this work. Mm -hmm. Now this piece over here, I can't say so much. <laughs> Um, but again, it's, I told her, you know, just tell me what you're comfortable with. How about this? Let's plan all the rooms that you want done and then we'll price them out. And then you'll come to me and say, Ooh, wow. Yeah. That's a little more aggressive than I thought it was going to be. Let's do one, two, and three, but guess what? Everything's planned. Mm -hmm. So now whenever you're ready, we just kind of go in, do a few tweaks and move on. And that's been very successful for me. Um, you know, people can still, um, be very successful financially, um, whether it's, you know, a husband and wife together or just a husband or whatever it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean they want to just blow money. I mean, I've had clients who've had more money than they can spend in 10 people's lifetimes and they don't act like that. And that's, um, I appreciate that. And that's the kind of clients I want, you know, they may have all the money to spend, but that doesn't mean they want, you know, $2,000 on that. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe they spend money on trips or their children are getting a really good education and then maybe they would need to buy cars for their kids or maybe they're saving or who knows? Guess what? Not my business. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, there's designers in Dallas that won't take a client unless their budget is 250,000. And I'm like, that's amazing, but um, that's not reality. And the people that I work with, you know, my average client budget is anywhere from 30 on the low end up to 75 and 80. Um, and people are surprised when they're like, okay, what's it going to cost for you to do my house? Like if I just gut it all, get rid of it and redo all new furniture, could you do it for 50? I'm like, I could, but here's where I think we'll fall short. And they're like, honestly, great. I love that. 
I'm willing to do 60, you know, or they'll kind of do that. And they know it's an investment, but um, people just want to know what they're in for. And, and in regards to fees, I know I'm, I'm rambling and talking about, <laughs> but um, fees are also, fees are sketchy. You got to be careful with that. Um, I, I, I stay around 150 an hour and that's because I don't, and, and I don't do it because I think I'm this great, you know, worth every penny. I know there are people who charge less and people will charge more. I feel like it's a good value and I feel like it keeps everybody in check. Um, if you are the person who answers your texts and your cell phones after a certain time and a client thinks that they can nonstop call text and communicate with you, it's never going to end. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> life is too short for that. I mean, I worked, 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 worked. I told you I got to that point in my business where, um, literally I explain it this way. You walk in and there are all these amazing plates perfectly spinning on all these little tiny sticks and you've just, you're killing it. You got it going. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. And I literally walked out of that room with spinning plates and slammed the door and I didn't care what fell. I didn't care what happened. And I know a lot of that was grief. Um, and I, I stepped away from my business for quite a while after my dad died. I mean, it rocked me really hard. Um, mm, yeah. And I mean, you know that you and I've discussed it, but, um, mm -hmm. of course now I hear him and he's like, seriously, get off your butt. <laughs> um, <laughs> to go back to work. Yeah. Stop it. Well, so, that's all, that is really excellent information. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Abby, I want to talk to you about your hashtag glam school because I think, uh, it's, it's a great name and that absolutely embodies everything that your design style is. It's got that little hint of little Hollywood glam. But I, I'd like to know how you came up with that. I decided, um, again, this was one of those times in my life where um, I had a lot of time on my hands. I had literally kind of backed away from my business and just kind of dealing with everything with my family. And one day I just got this crazy creative bug and I literally wrote three or four chapters of a book and I just said, I'm going to call this glam school. And it all stems back to what we were just talking about before, which is people coming up to me or, or contacting me, asking me, how do you do it? How do you do this? And then I also thought about my clients constantly stressing over how to style a bookshelf or their coffee table, you know, all the last minute elements that come in to a project or, or design. And so it just kind of came to me and I was like, wow, this is so great. I never come up with stuff this cool. And my <laughs> husband laughed because he's the one who's usually genius. He picks up stuff real quick and he's like, wow, that's really awesome. And I was like, yeah, thanks. And so <laughs> I kind of ran with it. Um, a good friend of mine who writes for the Dallas Morning News here is a really amazing editor and writer. And of course she edits a ton for um, the newspaper, but I asked her if she'd help me. And we literally spent a couple weeks, sat down and I wrote this book. Um, and you and I have discussed this as well, self-publishing versus a publisher. And then I don't know what happened. I just, my business picked up again and I just kind of went on the back of the shelf, but it's always there. And, and I've recently um, picked it back up again Ooh. and now it's kind of taken on a whole new perspective, which I love. And I look back at what I wrote and of course, some of it needs to be tweaked a little bit, but the message is still the same. I mean, glam, because I love glam and and a lot of my photographers always laugh. They're like, you and your mirrored pieces. <laughs> um, you know, it's always kind of a joke. They have to Photoshop themselves out of the mirror because you can see their feet or their camera. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then school because it's, um, I don't know. I, if you ask anyone who knows me, they'll tell you how much I dislike school, whether it be elementary all the way up to college. It just was not my thing. Um, I didn't apply myself as much as I should have, but I loved it. <laughs> I did great. And I'm thankful for the education I have, but, um, school because glam school sounds more fun. Right. And right. it's a good way to, I mean, everybody um, wants to go to glam school, right? Sure. And it brings <laughs> out an education, um, without it being, you know, wah, 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 wah. So <laughs> I, I keep that, um, I love I, that. yeah, so that's kind of the story behind that, but you know, I want the book to be a little bit more focused on the fundamentals of design from my perspective, not necessarily like when you go to college and you learn those types of fundamentals, cause that can be actually boring, but something that's fun. So if you're, if you're just not going to be able to afford a designer, you're, that's not something you'd ever do, but you're into design, which a lot of people are, as we know, it's, I want it to be a book they could pick up and go to a chapter about coffee table books and maybe they don't want to read because by the way, guess what? I don't want to read a bunch of stuff and I don't 
That's not my thing, but I love pictures because I communicate visually. So mm-hmm. I think, how can I communicate with people visually and with words to give them confidence to do things in their home or be inspired or not copy a picture? Like you don't have to copy the way this coffee table is done, but here are a couple elements to keep in mind when you're messing with your coffee table. Maybe you have this really cool piece that you want to just get rid of because you don't like it anymore, but put it in the mix. The next thing you know, maybe you love it. So Hmm. This little, I mean, it's cheesy and it's not worth a million bucks, but it's just information that is common sense and fun and that people like to absorb. So well, it's probably common sense to you because you do it all day long. Right, I know. Average person is yeah. something that you're really <laughs> interested in. I mean, I right. remember having that conversation with a friend of mine who, when I was coming out with uh, with my book, I was saying, you know, I don't who would want to know. She's like, I want to know all of that. I don't want to do yeah. any of that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess it's, that's a good point. You know, <laughs> but that's really fun because that's really embodies, I think, your design style. It's, it's very bold and sophisticated and colorful, and I really love that. Um, I want to talk about your two fur children. You have. <laughs> two dogs that pop up in your social media and they're super fun. What kind of dogs are they? Yes. How do you not love dogs? I mean, I love cats. Oh, really love my dogs. dogs are amazing. Yes. So Caddo is our Brittany and Caddo is basically, it's an Indian name. I mean, the Caddo tribe was around, um, you know, Louisiana, Arkansas, up through Kansas and Missouri area, but there's a lot of Caddo Um, Caddo Parish in Louisiana, Caddo Lake in Texas. Oh, Um, okay. I I just, we love the name. We named our dogs after Texas lakes because we have friends who name them after rivers and counties. So we thought it was kind of fun. So Caddo is named after Caddo Lake. And um, Ivy, which is O-H-I-V, it's a lake here in Texas. We couldn't find a, like, there's not really cute girly lake names in Texas. (laughs) That's how that happened. But Ivy is a German short-haired pointer. And both of the girls are... They're getting up there in age, but they're still super frisky. Cato oh, just beautiful. And Ivy's nine and a half, but um, yeah, they're awesome. We don't have children, and um, honestly, I mean, it's not like a big secret or a private thing. I just, you know, people quit asking when you get a little older. But you know, we just never got around to it. And then when we did get around to it, I think either my body or his basically were like, yeah, not happening. So just be cool with your dogs. Yeah, so, you're, I love your hashtag too. Uh, just dogs, no, no kids. Just dogs. <laughs> no kids just dogs. <laughs> so, so I know my husband came up with that one. Uh, I wanted to yeah. know um, if you could share a little design tip of how you keep your house looking so darn gorgeous with two dogs living in it. <laughs> um, it is again preparation and planning, and thank you for saying that. I'm, but you have to understand, I am a neat freak, and, and I like everything orderly and clean. I'm not a big tchotchke having a bunch of things around. So that's also part of it. Probably looks a little sterile, but it's coming down to planning. So when we remodeled the house that we're in now, um, and I do this a lot with my clients, it works just as well for kids as it does with dogs. But um, God, why would you not want to have something that would be cool if you spilt on it and it would totally bounce back? So right. and we have so many, you know resources these days. I mean, perennials is one of my favorite, but the Krypton fabrics have really come a long way. And a a lot of fabric manufacturers carry them. Lonnie Paul just came out with a great line from Duralee. They're pretty good basics some cute patterns, but everything is Krypton, which Krypton, um, you know, you hear a lot that people come out and spray treat things and that puts that top coat, which seals and protects the fibers, but Krypton, it's kind of more built into the fiber. So you've kind of got that element, which is great. But yeah, I mean, it's having fabrics that can take wear and tear. Now our dogs, um, we've been so fortunate, even when they were puppies. And I think a lot of it was just constantly staying on top of it. They have not really torn anything up. I mean, they did TT a lot. We had that, but um, we have cow high rug in our living room. And I know a lot of people may have love or hate with cow hide and Texas and it's cliche, yada, yada. But it's a cow, people. They roll around in mud and they're out in the elements <laughs> and then it rains or they get hosed off and then they're back to good as new. Well, that's what a rug does. That's um, interesting. See, yeah, coming from I mean, California, I would not know that about a cow hide rug. <laughs> well, when you get a little girl from Arkansas who's cattle <laughs> farmers, you learn all that. Um, yeah, that's why they stink so bad because they get hot and they roll around in mud and their poop and stuff. They're just, they're just cows. So yeah, but cowhide is an amazing product. So Krypton, um, cowhide, those are two really good materials. If you have animals. acrylics, yeah, anything acrylics. with acrylics. Um, and another thing for rugs, like a couple of these sorority houses I've been working on, they really feel, they get frustrated because they invest a lot of money 
in these houses, especially the stair runners and they get crushed or they get stained or they just look gross because, you know, they're not taking their shoes off and you have hundreds of girls up and down these stairs. And right, right. Polypropylene is my favorite. And just so you know, everyone out there, if you're in love with Stark's antelope, they have a polypropylene version called Antelocarpa. And no, it isn't the wool version. But it is very good and it is way more affordable and it is stunning. And wow. I've used a ton of it. I, my I closet in my home. It's great. You have to look. I want it too. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's not crazy. It's definitely reasonable. I mean, I have that gray on gray. I think it's called Jaguar from Stark in my closet at my house. And you can see vacuum marks in it. It does, you know, it's just like regular carpet. It's just a short, short pile, but it doesn't wear meaning you don't get like a ton of crushing or um, traffic marks. You just vacuum it out and it looks like no one ever walked on it. Um, if you spill on it, it, it beads up kind of almost like a Krypton or wow. you know, something like that. Um, but basically I always say, unless you burn it, you're not going to really hurt it. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are some excellent tips. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for people use, without pets, that's, those are great. Right. And that's what I'm saying. We use a lot of that around um, in our homes that have young families because kids don't know. I mean, okay, mom and dad invest a lot of money in this sofa and they love it, but they're like, I don't know if I want to spend that on this because, you know, he's going to tear that up and she's going to spill that. But if you provide them with fabrics that are, you know, workhorse fabrics, um, I have a home that I did. It was actually the one where you and I worked on those watercolor drapes. Mm, I love that home. I do too. I love that house. I so we just pretty. converted the the nursery to a big girl room. So it's super cute. Oh, that's that. so fun. But they have um, indoor outdoor rug in their living room. Their sofa is um, it is not Krypton, but it is heavily um, treated. The fabric is so it's very very durable. And that gorgeous orange velvet on their ottoman oh, is gorgeous. Also yeah. Now they have the Mongolian fur ottomans, but. Once the kids kind of get over petting it and combing it, then they're, you know, they move on. But you know, <laughs> their dogs, their kids, um, you know, I'm in and out of that house, at, you know, every couple times a year because we'll re finish redoing a room or whatever. And I absolutely just love that family. But yeah, I mean, same thing. We don't have to spend a ton of money on certain pieces, especially rugs because they have an older dog and he, you know, have accidents and things like that. Um, so, you know, we bring in things that, um, look really good and really high end and design style that she wants, but they didn't break the bank and they don't feel bad if something gets destroyed. And I, I think, think that's great. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, the resources these days, I mean, there's so much technology and so many uh, manufacturers that have gorgeous products that can just take a beating. So um, I think that's, that's so great. Yeah. Okay, well, while we're on tips, <laughs> this is going to come out right before the holiday, but we're coming up to 2019. What uh, are you feeling are going to be the trends for 2019? I think that's funny when people ask me that because, you know, as a designer, and I'm sure you see this too, we see things a year, maybe two before they hit. The and you people. see them, but like in California, it's going to be even later. <laughs> At least Not necessarily. <laughs> Well, okay. So High Point Market is the big design market. It's furniture mm -hmm. and, and things like that. That happens twice a year in North Carolina, October and April. And things that you see in October aren't even available to ship most likely until another six, eight months, right? Mm -hmm. So these stores or designers who are ordering things or want access to things aren't going to get those things for six to eight months. So it sounds really snotty, but by the time we get a hold of things, we're like, oh, I'm so overseeing this. So I hate this. I'm tired of this trend. I'm over it. And so when people ask me that, I'm like, uh, wait, trend for like in design with me or with a, a retailer or with a client. So I have to really readjust my brain there. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've seen a ton of lately, and I'm personally was never into it. Um, it's that kind of Scandinavian tonal thing that's been going on for a while. And I love it. I think it's beautiful. Um, but you know, I have to have color. So Me too. Uh, I need color. I do too. And I, and there's nothing against monochromatics. I think it's definitely got its place mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but I think that, you know, it's funny. They just announced coral as the color of the year. <gasps> I love it. I do too. But I actually, um, answered this question for an article that's coming out, um, in the next week or two. And I said that I think orange orange in the context of that kind of seventies boho vibe coming back but not cheese ball seventies where it's overdone mid-century modern furniture and elements. But I think people love that vibe because it is happy and it's got oh. a lot of glee and joy and, you know, free love and all that fun stuff. But, um, 
it mixes and matches really well with modern, with traditional. Mm-hmm. And orange um, is like red. It's a color you've really got to learn to control and mm-hmm. use it properly and find the hot really color. Yeah. For it. Yeah. Sure. Um, but I just think it's so stunning and it's rich. And I think it's done in the right way. Um, you know, the collars, our dog's collars are hunter orange. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's so that you can see them when they're out in the field. They wear vests and stuff too and they hunt. But um, mm-hmm. Orange and gray together just kill me. I think it's so sophisticated and stunning and I I love it in fashion. I love it in home. So I think that that's something we're going to see that kind of seventies comeback, but in a little bit more um, mix and match way less. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to put the Eames table and the tulip table, you Mm -hmm. know, a little Mm -hmm. less that I think that's going to be big. And I also think florals are going to continue I love florals. Love florals. I do too. And not like grandma you know mm-hmm. like big overscaled just yeah modern just beautiful mm-hmm. and and effortless um you know we're and they do they have their place obviously when I do these sorority houses the girls love that and um the house I'm working on right now is in Nebraska and they're like okay so we're cool with it a little bit but we don't want to be so girly that it's like ugh, because we have to stare at it for eight to ten years so mm-hmm. I think that these classic modern florals are going to be real big because you're starting to see it now in wallpaper, which is also mm-hmm. I think people that go wallpaper, whatever. Um, it's been, it's been back, but I don't think it's going anywhere. And I still think that done in the right way. Um, but wallpaper has to be worth it, right? You don't want to do a wallpaper. That's just like, doesn't really do anything. Okay. Woo. He used a boring wallpaper. It makes me think of a hospital or an office building. So you're going to be seeing wallpaper <laughs> that are more impactful, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. Especially so, as you have a lot of uh, indie designers are coming up, so you're going to see a lot more choices and selections and and right. And I rockets. think too, minimalism, I think is is got to eventually run its course. Um, it just it looks beautiful, styled in a magazine, and I I love magazines. I, I feel like they're kind of I don't know they're not like they used to be, and that's a whole other conversation. But exactly. um, <laughs> when you go through HGTV or House Beautiful or um, even, you know, better homes and gardens, whatever it is. I used to, I just couldn't wait for them to come. And I, mm-hmm. I loved it because I wanted to see what people were doing. Mm-hmm. So you're not really seeing trends in them anymore. You're, I feel like they're kind of grasping, like, what do we think is going to be cool? What should we do? And they shoot so far in advance. Right. So you'll see a project for Christmas that was shot, you know, the March before. Correct. <laughs> um, so I feel like, um, being online with bloggers and of course, Instagram, which is my favorite social media, that's when you kind of really start to get a gauge on what's happening and what mm-hmm. people are drawn to. And, um, you know, like the Chip and Joanna, Joanna Gaines, the Magnolia situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I love a good farmhouse, but that's not really my scene. I mean, I can appreciate yeah, it. But I, yeah. I'm kind of, see, I'm, ship, I'm ship lapped out. <laughs> I'm way ship lapped out. I've seen so much of it. I just feel like, I don't know, you know, when it comes to my own personal style, like I am just, I'm an artist, so I'm going to go for color. Uh, all the time. <laughs> and, yeah, and I don't know if you feel like this, but when I approach a project and someone asks me, they're like, well, we kind of want neutrals. We want to tone it down. I'm like, well, I'm not going to work for you then because <laughs> I can do, totally do that, but I'm going to be so bored. And then yeah. I'll start banging my head against the wall. I can't do it. And I, and I love that. I can be honest with myself about that now. It's like, I need a little color. I need a little fur. I well, need some actually, too, actually, you may not be the right designer for them. And maybe the perfect designer is somebody who would really love to do neutrals. I mean, I always tell my clients when I meet them, like, this is a marriage. I mean, you, yep. I, have to, I have to be in it as much as you're in it. <laughs> we we yeah. have to like each other. <laughs> you're right. I'm and I always and find to walk away from it, too, because they may, there may be another person that it's just a more perfect fit for them. And the, yep. everybody will be happier, you know. Yeah, I definitely know what you're talking about there. And that's <laughs> part of half the battle getting into something that doesn't go back to our conversation of stress and exactly, exactly. So I, oh gosh, this has just been so great, Abby. I just so much wonderful information. I appreciate it, but I want a little bit more. So I want to ask you what, (laughs) (laughs) okay. So I would love to hear what your words of advice would be for a young creative starting out and maybe even just a a young creative entrepreneur, not necessarily someone who wants to go into interior design. Right. I think, um, like I said earlier, really doing the research and understanding 
um, those elements that you want to incorporate in your business or in whatever it is that you're choosing to do. And then again, get that experience, you know, surround yourself with the people who are doing the things that you want to do. Also, put yourself in situations that make you uncomfortable because that's when you really, um, that's when you really learn what you do and don't want. And I know it sounds very cliche and simple, but you know, I worked a job um, that I thought was going to go a certain way, and I loved it. And things changed, and you know, I wanted to just stomp my feet and get out of there. You know, take my toys and leave. And um, you know, again, my father was like, "What are you doing? Like, use this as an experience to find out how you don't want to do things." Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, that can apply in, in your business and your personal life. So everyone's different and everyone has their way. And then here's my perspective. There's no wrong or right way to do what you want to do. Now, there are obviously basics, um, in starting a business, you know, having your taxes and, and all those things that legally need to be done and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, really having your business, um, think about it. And and one good piece of advice that someone gave me and that has really been crucial is you cannot, and you will not be able to do everything and do it well. <laughs> so surround yourself or hire those who are good at what you're not good at and be okay with that happening. Be okay mm-hmm. with you not being mm-hmm. the person who does everything. Because when I did this, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to do everything. And if I'm not there and if it's not me, da, da, da. Um, I have girls that work with me that do things. There's no way I could do what they do. And it's, it's endearing and it's humbling, but it's also realistic. Okay. Where am I better to spend my time for this project and for my client's investment? Uh It's not this because what, what such and such can do in 30 minutes takes me two hours. And it's not, it's not that I'm not um, successful at that. It's just, I think that makes me better at being successful because I've had to learn, let it go. You're not good at this. You can do it. You're definitely capable of it, but you're also in the position to have this person do it and do it right and do it better. And that frees you up to do the things you love more. So those layers are important. For instance, bookkeeping and accounting. Oh, yuck. I mean, (laughs) just it's literally, I, it gives me hives. And um, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I took a class on QuickBooks. Now, I don't do it like my bookkeeper does and, and the accountant then gets it from the bookkeeper and they come back to me and they're like, what is this? I'm like, I don't know. You're stressing me out. And they're like, stop. God, I'm just asking what, what that meant. <laughs> I get so sensitive about it. But I did. I made myself take QuickBooks classes. Not enough to be an accountant, but enough to manage my business because it's important for me to understand what's going on. I'm not saying that someone's going to take advantage of me, but I need to be able to know that when I input this in a certain category, how that will affect the outcome of um, my business and my Mm -hmm. clients and and everything else that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Um, So that when my accountant pulls that report, he's like, good job. You did a good job. I have a couple questions. And then those questions are easily answered because I know what I'm doing to a point. So takes the stress out of it. I think that's a yeah. really, really great advice. Yeah. Those so death, death and taxes. <laughs> taxes yeah. is the worst and bookkeeping is the worst. But guess what? If your books are out of wackadoodle, you are in big trouble. Um, you yeah, do not want I, that. No, you don't. And that that's part of being the transparency with your clients too. You have to be able to always show what the numbers are. And um, I don't know. I always tackle that stuff like out the gate, get it done, take care of it, done. Mm-hmm. Like you said, <laughs> you just face it and address it. It's not one exactly. It's not one to procrastinate on at all, for sure. Well, yeah, because in Texas so- we have to file our taxes um, depending on our sales, right? So I have to do it every mm-hmm. month, and it's right, right, yeah. Well, part of thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Abby. This was just yeah, thank you wow, a really ton of it. information. Thank you for for being so generous and sharing. Of course. Wow. So. Okay, well, I will have everything about Abby and where you can follow her and where you can shop her products and all her um, wonderful places that you can find her and the show notes. And thank you again, Abby. This is just of course. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like this podcast and you'd like to support it even more, you can join me over on patreon.com slash Mari Robeson and become a patron of mine. 
If you're a patron of mine, you'll receive bonus episodes every month, only for patrons. You'll also receive 20% off all the merchandise in my online shop, mariropeson.bigcartel, and you will be receiving free printables every month that will be of my artwork and they're some really fun things. You can follow along on Instagram and you can see what I'm creating just for my patrons. I would deeply appreciate it. It would help me keep the lights on and it would help me pay all the fees that it takes to put together a podcast like this so that I can keep supporting all the artists, keep bringing you great information, keep paying it forward to the next generation of artists. It's just a wonderful thing and I would really deeply appreciate your support.